a lot. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you enjoyed lunch and are ready for some more of Copernicus Inspire uh, mixed with some open data ingredients. I'm working for the European Commission for DG Regional and Urban Policy and um, amongst our uh, portfolio is uh, the analysis of urban phenomena and uh, I will just go briefly through a few examples of how we try to combine uh, Copernicus products, inspire uh, data and open data to enhance the analysis of urban areas in Europe. Um, this is perhaps the wrong one. This is the right one. First, uh, very briefly, a few words about the policy context, about how uh, we can uh, uh, meet uh, some challenges and find some opportunities for uh, the com in combining Inspire, Copernicus, and Open Data. And we will illustrate this with a few examples on, uh, of analysis and reporting use within the context of uh, uh, regional and urban policy. The worldwide context, well, urban phenomena, they are at uh, one of the headlines of uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, where uh, one of the goals uh, is about making cities as inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. This is in more concrete terms translated in a set of uh, uh, development goal indicators, amongst which indicators on sustainable transport, on access to green and public spaces, and so on. Cities and urban areas also have their, these uh, very uh, prominently their place in a number of other uh, sustainable development goals. At European level, um, our DG is responsible for the uh, uh, conception and the implementation of cohesion policy. And in the programming period 2014-20, which is up and running, right now, uh, there's an, an increased focus on instruments um, promoting um, sustainable integrated urban development with a specific chunk of the ERDF funding going to this kind of uh, instruments and also by adding innovative actions, cooperation instruments and uh, an urban development network. So all these instruments uh, uh, benefit from an enhanced analysis and knowledge, quantitative knowledge, on what is happening in Europe's cities. Now, there is a, a decent statistical framework for the collection and dissemination of urban indicators through uh, the, the network of Eurostat and the National Statistical Institutes, but nevertheless, um, there's an ever-increasing need for comparable and, uh, data and indicators. And on some uh, topics, the traditional statistical system fails, uh, due to its, its historical setup, fails to, to produce um, meaningful indicators because some indicators are better off by uh, uh, being produced by, by combi combining uh, spatial data. So there, uh, opportunities occur for the combina combination of uh, Inspire data, Copernicus data, and open data, hopefully. Which brings us to a few examples of what, uh, with our relatively modest resources, we have been doing in the past few years on uh, uh, combining this kind of spatial data sets. I will uh, very briefly uh, mention uh, an analysis on the proximity of green urban areas, on the access to urban public transport, on uh, spatial disaggregation of population and employment in urban areas, on rail passenger services, and finally also uh, give you a hint about what we have been doing in, in order to feed the analysis in the State of European Cities report. Proximity to green urban areas. Traditionally, it's, it's quite easy from uh, basic uh, spatial data or from administrative sources to find data about the presence of green urban areas in cities, just the extent of the areas. 
but how do these areas relate to the location of population? How do these areas fulfill their functions for the urban population? Which brings us to the question, what is the relationship between the, the location of these, urban, uh, these green areas towards the location of the residential population? And to answer this question, we combined Copernicus Urban Atlas information about the urban land use with uh, detailed, spatially detailed uh, information about the distribution of population. This, and depending on the countries, this could be uh, the one square kilometer geostat population grid or other sub-local population distribution data by statistical sector or similar census tract and so on. <coughs> this led to uh, an alternative indicator on uh, proximity of green urban areas being the, uh, the, the surface of green urban areas to which population has an easy access at walking distance. I won't expand on the details of the methodology because we have described the methodology and the results and you will also find the accompanying data in a working paper that has been published on the uh, DJ Radio website. Second item of analysis, uh, a bit similar than the previous one in, in so far that it also explores the relationship between spatial distribution of population in the cities but in this case, in comparison to the offer of urban public transport. It's not enough that you measure the, uh, the walking distance of population to the public transport stops, because then, well, we also wanted to take into account the, the actual offer, the frequency of the departures you can find at these stops. So again, the first two items of what we needed and in terms of data are the same as in the previous case, urban atlas plus population distribution. But here, uh, there was a uh, substantial ingredient of open data needed on the location of the stops, uh, which is well, quite well, relatively straightforward if you go to uh, data like OpenStreetMap and so on. But what is more cumbersome are timetable data and there, we struggled to get open data from some countries, some cities, sometimes data provided under license. That was uh, relatively messy to get at. And, well, as you can see from uh, the map here, we were able to analyze uh, these uh, phenomena in a number of cities. For some countries, we've got complete coverage of all the cities, but uh, there, there's still much more to do and, uh, well, the missing data, the missing areas here, it's just due to the, the absence of open data or the absence of published data on, on timetables. Again, I won't go into detail. Here as well, you find a working paper with the methodology, the results on the same website. But all these analyses suppose that you've got a very high resolution of population distribution inside your city. Alternatively, or even better, it could also be very interesting to look into employment distribution. And while the uh, population grid at one square kilometer and the uh, uh, census tract data are already a very good start, uh, for this proximity analysis, you ideally need to go to uh, a much higher detail. And then, well, in many cases, in many countries, you're uh, confronted to issues of confidentiality, privacy, protection, and so on. Which brings us to the fact that uh, disaggregation algorithms of population or employment are still needed. And um, here, Urban Atlas, with the land use classification and especially distinction between residential and non-residential built-up areas, is very interesting, but even more, the Inspire Building Units uh, um, layer theme is uh, extremely interesting in such a way that uh, it 
provides us with the build, not only the build, uh, building footprint, but in many cases also with a function of the buildings, and even more interesting, with an, an information about the volume or the number of floors. And in a few test cases, uh, focusing on uh, data on Madrid and on uh, Flanders, um, it can be demonstrated that using this kind of uh, building units uh, data with some height information increases the performance of the uh, disaggregation algorithms and produce, produces a much more uh, reliable uh, estimate of uh, sublocal population figures at the level of an urban atlas polygon. There's some uh, reporting on the test case on the uh, website of the European Forum for Geography and Statistics if you want to read more details. Then we also try to look into the performance of uh, Europe-wide rail passenger services. There, the problem in terms of data accessibility and so on was a bit different in, su in such a way that uh, the first challenge was to get hold of uh, comprehensive rail timetable data that in the end we succeeded in, in, in obtaining these data. Uh, we combined this with a harmonized city definition and population distribution. Not really a problem, but uh, there, there's still, and I put it in red without, uh, with a purpose, because there the location of stations and the integration with uh, uh, a seamless uh, railway network still substantially hinders um, further steps in the analysis. Still, we were able to do some uh, analysis on this, but again, if you would read the, the resulting working paper, you would find out that uh, there, there are clearly still uh, some limits on what can be done on the basis of the, uh, the currently available uh, data. And together with other actors in the field like uh, Eurostat, uh, uh, DG uh, Transport and Mobility of the European Commission, we try to enhance the integration of the uh, uh, station location information, timetable information, and the actual network information. Finally, um, many of these analyses, together with uh, uh, other quantitative uh, data, have uh, uh, fed the, uh, the creation of the State of the European Cities report. That is, uh, this is a, a joint European Commission UN Habitat a publication that will be released very soon in October at the uh, uh, UN Habitat 3 conference in Ecuador, in Quito. And uh, well, apart from the analysis I have sh just shown, it also builds on contri expert contributions and uh, quantitative analysis based on, on Eurostat data and, uh, and many other sources. So this is, I think, uh, really uh, a report to look forward to. Um, it will be uh, available on the relevant websites uh, once the conference will take place in the third week of October. So I think that, um, well, these uh, urban examples uh, show that there, there's, uh, with, uh, by combining uh, Copernicus uh, data, Inspire data, also open data, there's a substantial potential for increasing uh, the, uh, the uh, quantitative uh, knowledge and analysis on urban areas, provided that data are standardized, that they are timely, preferably authoritative, accessible and reliable. That's a lot of conditions. Some are more easily fulfilled than others. We are not yet there. Uh, in the meantime, sometimes we help ourselves out by using commercial and or voluntary geodata. They're very helpful, but in the long run, there's sometimes the absence of a guarantee of sustainability of all this. And so uh, we, we really need further steps in, in producing authoritative, um, uh, data that in the end could be used also for, for kind of yeah, official spatially based uh, indicators and statistics. So there, there's, there's still some work to do on uh, uh, Copernicus services, on uh, Inspire implementation, and not in the least also on well, promoting 
the openness of data and the standardization of, of uh, data themes, which are perhaps not always uh, covered by the Inspire Direct. In the slides, you will find a few more references to other documents that can help you if you want to uh, understand more of the background. Thanks a lot. That's it for the time being. Uh, thank you, Bobo, for this very interesting talk. In fact, several examples in the same field where Copernicus, Inspire, and Open Data are coming together. Uh, as we said at the beginning of the session, we'll keep the questions for the end of the session. We will group them. Uh, so I would like to invite now the second speaker, Minder de Vries, uh, from Deltares Foundation from the Netherlands. Uh, and this will be rather a use case on the investigation of flood risk. So totally different area, but again, their uh, use of Copernicus services and inspired data will be key. Yeah. We are wrestling with the technology. Oh, there's the switch. It's there. It is moving slowly into focus. Yeah. And now F5, and it will start. F5, yeah. Take this. Thank you. This is your microphone. I, I can talk here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. From the Netherlands, a story about uh, shorelines, vegetation, flood risk reduction. Um, I'm uh, coordinating an FP7 project, space from the space uh, team. Uh, called FAST, foreshore assessment using space technology, and in this project. We are aiming to develop a Copernicus server, downstream service, um, to develop open source products based on Sentinel, using Sentinel data, uh, to gain new uh, earth observation, uh, in, spatial information on foreshores and flood plate characteristics, um, uh, focusing on, 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 on a new uh, algorithms that we are developing to uh, characterize sediment, uh, sediment uh, uh, properties and vegetation properties. Uh, and we are building a software tool called MISAFE. It sort of relates to flood safety, you can imagine that. Um, uh, and it is supporting, also support, we are supporting services and we uh, try to, to, uh, to uh, put them in, to uh, formulate them into software license agreements. Uh, and we use something called the open earth environment uh, uh, as a basis. Open earth is in the Netherlands a group uh, uh, developed by a consortium of the ma market uh, uh, government and knowledge institutes um, to really provide an open source, open data structure to quickly develop uh, 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 services for, uh, for uh, um, use, use cases. Uh, MISAFE itself is uh, on the left hand side, uh, 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 sort of the science in this picture, um, working, in, uh, 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 working on developing algorithms from, uh, from earth observations in, 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 uh, in study sites. Uh, developing um, uh, all kinds of uh, 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 wave reduction and sediment stability algorithms um, and uh, put them into general rules that we can uh, use in a predictive model to give us information on the flood risk capabilities and uh, characteristics of any foreshore in the world. We are both going to, uh, uh, putting these algorithms into an open da data and open source structure. That is the open earth structure. I will come back to that. And we are linking that to uh, 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 Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 uh, uh, derived information uh, to be able to predict what's going on on a certain uh, foreshore somewhere in the world. So the MISAFE tool is, go is delivering that information to users. And if you look to this, well, uh, this, this tool, it has sort of three Three layers. We call it an educational tool, which is which is, has a global kind of application. You click on a map, and you get information from any coast in the world, including information that is derived from Sentinel. For instance, the vegetation characteristic of that foreshore. Um, uh, it has a, an expert. Uh, 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 um, we call it modality to be 
to zoom in into a certain uh, location and in the highest possible uh, level of detail derive that information uh, as a combination of earth observation and uh, model, uh, numerical model predictions. And there is an advanced modality which is not online, but which is the, 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 the interaction with interested end users for, for their location to, uh, to do that kind of analysis combining their, in their data, their expertise with our expertise and our data to make that next level. Um, uh, if you look here, this is the tool of, the, of the, this is an example of the education model, the educational modality of the tool. Anywhere on the, on the, on the uh, world you can click on a coast, you will get information uh, 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 on the characteristics of that coast, including uh, data derived from, uh, from the Sentinel uh, satellites. Um, very much giving you information on how, how is this coast working in relation to flood risk reduction properties of that coast. Of course, this is global information from global data sets uh, that, we, uh, that we have uh, 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 combined, and it comes with disclaimers because it's not uh, 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 based on an in-depth study of that coastline. Uh, uh, it's a sort of... Um, first taste of what, uh, what is going on on that coastline. If you go to the, the next level, the expert modality, we are using high resolution images and we are, for instance, in this, uh, this uh, example, deriving um, uh, intertidal, intertidal uh, uh, um, bathymetry, um, elevation maps, based on combinations of what we, uh, what we have available already from 30 years of Landsat and what Sentinel is now delivering on top of that. Uh, an interesting thing uh, to mention here is that here we run into issues with uh, uh, processing large amounts of data f quickly and uh, in an uh, uh, automated, simple way. And we, at this moment, at that moment are, have been using uh, the, the Google Earth Engine for that, but we are moving to the ESA uh, serv uh, service as soon as that, that uh, um, uh, is uh, uh, delivering what we need. And it seems that sort of we go in that direction and we will be able to do that in the next months. Um, uh, overall, if you look to the data structures and the data flows of FAST, uh, on the top you see the ESA Sentinel data server, um, where we upload, uh, where we sort of put our algorithms, so we keep the algorithms very close to the data, we process the scripts there, and we download the information from that uh, uh, analysis to our geo servers. And uh, the geo servers will be, um, uh, 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 will pro pro provide a, a VM, uh, WMS uh, kind of a uh, server to our web viewer, which I showed you some sort of peak, uh, some sort of, sort of screen a few slides ago, which we call the educational and the expert version of the web viewer. On the right hand side, you see the input of the, of the, the experts, uh, also the input of the field data uh, and the experts uh, to uh, deliver our um, uh, 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 um, algorithms. There also there is uh, uh, Inspire coming, on, coming into, into the uh, into view because we need to have these data sets from the field data but also from the earth observation data into a uh, uh, um, uh, uh, very well organized structure that is online accessible for, uh, and, uh, and uh, traceable by, uh, by uh, users. Uh, on, on the bottom, you can see the Deltares uh, um, uh, model data server, which, which has this numerical model, which is also, also used by, let, let's say, 10,000 people at this moment all over the world. It's also a community um, which is taking up this information and producing quantified information on flood risk reduction characteristics. So if you go a little bit deeper in the open earth, uh, open earth uh, philosophy, you see here uh, this um, uh, 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 sort of stages, data stages of how we work uh, uh, the data from raw data to the to, uh, online web view, viewable data. And you can see here that we, on, the, on the top you see that the, that the scientists, and, uh, uh, in our case, are very much delivering raw data and delivering the algorithms. Um, uh, we are standardizing it. Uh, uh, this is like the, the raw data, the, the portal that we develop for our scientists to put the data in. We standardize the data and um, uh, we then tailor, tailor the data to net, into uh, uh, net CDFs that we sort of put into our uh, geo, uh, that geo servers. Everything is developed in open source, open, uh, open data structures. Uh, here you can, can see the web servers uh, 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 using uh, uh, an interaction with our uh, uh, data on the server. And in the end, you see how we catalog the data 
in a uh, inspired um, uh, uh, of conform the inspired formats. They will look to insp insp inspire and, and the standards that we need because we want to have this data mainstream, organized uh, for everybody uh, to understand and open and accessible. Uh, of course, we have to describe what what is in this data. What do the data mean? What is the quality of this data? Uh, we see inspire as a as an a, a, a very big chunk of that uh, um, uh, 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 the, uh, the CCS pair delivering a big chunk of that, those requirements, but we, we also in our, our FAST project create new teams. We create new, we use new data sources, so it's incomplete. Uh, we are now uh, uh, f uh, combining standards. Next, on top of Inspire, we are using other standards to be able to describe our data to the fullest. Um, and we discovered that we need agreement of, on new teams and new objects, and that, had, that needs to be done with our national government or with co co other governments. And that's where we, I think, are now, we are at a point, have arrived at a point in time that that is really now uh, a uh, priority uh, issue to be solved. Um, well, so applying this INSPIRE and other, other uh, uh, standards, what we now see that, we, that in the coastal domain, domain that we focus on huh, with our flood risk reduction stuff, uh, uh, the coastal domain is incompletely described. We find offshore domain and we need the offshore domain also because we have the water levels, the storm surge levels, the waves, all kinds of stuff coming in to, into our coast that we need to do the calculations. Um, uh, not in, in, not uh, available in the INSPIRE. Uh, we are using, are using new techniques, eh, like the Sentinel, but also uh, in the field we are doing all kinds of new stuff, which is not really uh, 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 straightforward uh, uh, found in the, in, the, uh, in the standards that we have. So we are um, a little bit out on the fringe and outside of what the CF convention and the Inspire are, are uh, 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 making available for us. But in the same time, what can be made Inspire conform is made Inspire conform. And here, for instance, is our example on the, on the digital, digital train models that we have on our FAST, for sure assessment using space technology geo network uh, catalog, and which is uh, in the Delta sort of ecosystem. Um, uh, integrated in all the, the, the uh, um, uh, geo server information that we have there. So we are, we are sort of streaming with our, our uh, uh, project into the mainstream of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the, the, the open earth family of projects, which includes at least five or six uh, EU projects that are working on the same, uh, in the same uh, uh, line. So what, what are we doing within FAST that contributes to Inspire? We develop a specific, a specific vocabulary for coastal mapping and coastal processes. That's not in there yet. Uh, for vegetation mapping, vegetation characteristics, for typical uh, specific uh, algorithms uh, using uh, uh, Sentinel uh, 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 images. We uh, create an OGC service uh, that makes all this information available on the web, makes it discoverable, and we have it exchangeable as on open data. So we are, I think, uh, really uh, moving in the, in the right direction, and we uh, are solving, and we need to solve a number of issues uh, still. Uh, but this stuff is basically working. And uh, uh, because we are in the mainstream of our open source, uh, our open earth uh, way of working. This is quite uh, straightforward for us of, of doing it. Um, so, what is our the value of fast? Uh, uh, I think to the community, uh, we are creating this educational modality which is accessible to all. Uh, in there, we have a lot of global data sources and Sentinel data and Landsat data also uh, combined uh, about storm uh, uh, storm searches, average levels uh, 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 on the global. Uh, this, uh, uh, scale, the bathymetry and elevation information is connected, vegetation coverage, vegetation types are connected. You can imagine, for instance, if you have mangroves or self salt marshes, these act very dif different in flood risk reduction because mangroves are very big and you need that kind of information um, to distinguish it from salt marshes. Um, uh, and we need, we need, and we of course add uh, uh, highly, highly advanced numerical modeling to that. Uh, in the mix, the X-Beach uh, 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 um, beach numerical model. Of course, in the expert model, the modality we added at much higher resolution work for study sites, and um, in the advanced modality, we 
add this high resolution potential for any user uh, uh, who is interested to work together with us and um, uh, uh, interact uh, uh, to uh, adapt and apply this information to their sites. And at this moment, we are doing that for the Environment Agency in, uh, in the UK, together with the University of Cambridge, and we are doing it for Dutch Dutch uh, uh, government, and we are even working together with Army Corps of Engineers in the U.S. to apply this, for instance, uh, for a New Jersey site where they had the impact of Sandy. So it is really sort of creating interest and also creating additional information that people do not have in other places of the world. For, uh, we have disaster risk reduction teams running around. Uh, the last one, one of our missions was to Philippines to the Tacloban area, and now we already online can deliver all the information they need to get the first impression how the coastline of these areas is working in flood reduction uh, capability. So stuff is going on. It is uh, um, uh, quite sort of active, and uh, we are uh, uh, happy with that, uh, what's going on. The XBeach community, I already uh, uh, mentioned that one. This is, it is getting quite... Uh, uh, important for us because there are a lot of developers in, developers in that community that are helping us to make also the next uh, next step. Uh, uh, and we discovered that this, this combining these uh, earth observation uh, in images, these global maps, um, uh, uh, combined with the new Sentinel information and the modeling is, is delivering a very powerful tool that, that creates interest all over the world. Um, it is generic. You, uh, the, earth, uh, the open earth uh, uh, work is generic, and um, uh, uh, we apply it in multiple domains, not only in this flood risk reduction, but it is uh, being, uh, being applied uh, uh, in uh, many different, uh, different uh, topics. Uh, last sheet. Um, so we are moving now to, uh, to showcases of high resolution outputs. We are working with clients to, uh, to also to hammer out the services that are, are needed. We are linking earth observation to flood risk reduction analysis. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, we are uh, work, working together with the EU Risk It project uh, to really uh, 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 move from storm surge predictions to foreshore flood risk reduction capabilities to dike and dune breaching to flooding to damage. So the whole train from, from the ocean, from the sea to the inland is now connected and uh, being, being made available for users. And we are doing that in the Delft International Software Days. This is, I think, the number five uh, 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 version because we do that every year. Uh, and we have a symposium there on earth observation and data science and we are setting up, having workshops there where we combine what FAST can do and what risk it can do for users in workshops. So we are, also you are invited to, uh, to, inscribe, to inscribe for this workshop and to uh, get more inside information in what is possible. Um, I, met, I showed you a number of websites which you can use to access that and I think uh, I conclude my, my presentation with this uh, last remark. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mindert, uh, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Yet another use case in another domain, but uh, very comprehensive. And I was very impressed, and I'm curious about this educational track and what it offers to, well, regular people that want to know about what's happening in the neighborhoods regarding flooding. Uh, questions later on. Uh, so I will invite now the third speaker, uh, which is uh, Nuria Balkachel. So I hope that I pronounce it correctly, uh, from the IGN uh, in Spain, so the National Mapping Agency of Spain. Uh, she will speak about deriving Copernicus land cover and land use data from national data sets following bottom-up approach. I hope you find... Shall I do it? You have to click very fast. Oh, is it here already? Oh, okay. okay. hmm. I'm sorry. We like to help. <laughs> this one should be it, huh? Or you have to do it then. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm not technical. <laughs> we can see something, yeah? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. May I see what is it about this? Is it possible to. to Okay. 
Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nuria Valcarcel. I work for the National Mapping Agency of Spain, uh, which is also the National Reference Center on Land Cover, Land Use, and Spatial Statistics. And um, I'm here representing the Eagle Group uh, for show you, show you uh, what we are doing uh, regarding uh, how to derive uh, land cover and land use databases from national uh, sources using a bottom-up approach and according to INSPIRE. What is EAGLE? EAGLE means INET Action Group of Land Monitoring in Europe. We formed the group in 2009 and uh, the, 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 the members are experts for the dif different uh, national reference centers on land cover and land use. And our goal is to obtain a conceptual uh, solution for promoting an European capacity on land monitoring, but focusing in uh, uh, build this information from, uh, uh, from a bottom-up approach and using the national uh, different data sets and inventories. So uh, we uh, integrate different land cover and use information for several sources, both national and European. Uh, we also uh, produce uh, several tools and, and, and products to compare and to analyze the semantic differences uh, between uh, nomenclatures and, and data models. Um, we, uh, of course, are compatible with uh, a Copernicus uh, product, such as uh, uh, Korean, high resolution layers, urban atlas, and so on. And uh, finally, uh, the concept is based in uh, the ISO TC211 standard and the INSPIRE data specification. Uh, this is a picture of the group. Uh, sorry. Yeah, uh, I'm missing one slide, but uh, it's okay. Um, we, we first uh, work in, a, uh, in the development of the concept, uh, conceptual uh, solution, the conceptual data model, which, as, as I said, is based on the inspired data specification. We use uh, different uh, land, co land cover classes, uh, such as the land cover unit, observation, uh, etc. But we uh, uh, enhance this inspired data specification on land cover with additional classes which, uh, which are the land cover components and adding also the existing land use uh, features and code lists and other links with uh, several inspired themes. Uh, just to try to summarize an example, if we consider an uh, uh, inland uh, wetland or a continental uh, wetland, we can just uh, label this wetland uh, uh, with the Korean code, but instead we can for sure uh, choose the, 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 the right class for uh, this, this piece of landscape, but also describe what is inside of this wetland. Because uh, as you can imagine, it's, it's very different in a uh, Mediterranean country and in a uh, Nordic country, the same Korean class. So we uh, describe the content of uh, inland water, trees, shrubs, uh, herbaceous vegetation and so on with several land cover components and attributes. So uh, to develop the data model, we use three application sch schemas uh, from the Inspire land cover data specification and also the uh, land use hierarchical classification uh, of Inspire and include several features, classes, code lists or data types uh, from some other uh, inspired themes such as buildings, hydrography, natural risk zone, geology, geology and so on. Uh, uh, the results were uh, uh, presented in, in, in Enterprise Architect to be uh, easily consulted. And uh, after finalizing the conceptual data model, we produced the uh, associated uh, Eagle databases with an entry relationship uh, diagram to database implementation, both in uh, uh, post uh, post uh, format and SRE format, 
uh, all the necessary documentation to, to use this, this uh, two database templates and uh, an additional uh, query uh, tool because these data these templates are not uh, easily to be uh, queried by non-expert users. So we consider that the, the, the solution has to be very uh, uh, easy uh, for uh, a, a final user. After uh, finalizing this, this database implementation, we uh, did uh, uh, a third uh, activity, uh, which is the geometric test case. And uh, this, this activity uh, consists in the population of uh, uh, several EAGLE databases in uh, several European countries. We work in Austria, Finland, Hungary, Netherlands, and in uh, two cross-border uh, zones from Spain and Portugal and uh, Bulgaria and Romania. For each the site, uh, two EGLE databases were generated. One combining the information uh, provided by Corinne Landcover 2012 and the high resolution layer in EGLE format. And the second one in the same area uh, obtained by uh, aggregation or generalization of the information uh, contained in, in the national data set. And finally, we compare the result to uh, analyze the differences and identify the capabilities, the possibilities, and, but also the problems and difficulties uh, for using this EGLE concept for a, a, a future land monitoring system. Uh, due to the, the, the limited uh, time and resources that we had for this activity, uh, we tried to focus on some thematic contents in each the site. For example, in Austria, we focus in artificial parameters. In, in Bulgaria and Romania, uh, the site, we focus in, in agricultural and water information. In the uh, cross-border be between Spain and Portugal, we uh, look at a very typical uh, Iberian uh, landscape, uh, such as the Deesa or the Colmado uh, 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 land. In Finland, we focus in, in forest parameters, angry agricultural, and in Netherlands, we focus also uh, in agricultural and farm uh, information. So, for each test uh, site, as I said, first we produce the integrated European product uh, combining CLC uh, vector geometries with the raster information provided by the high resolution layer. And uh, the result is a database with the, mainly with uh, the information contained in three tables. One with the land cover uh, uh, units, the polygons, uh, in, according to Inspire, but also to Eagle data model. And two other one containing the Eagle land cover component information and attributes. In the second, for each the site, in the second, that Eagle database, we generalize the information uh, in two ways. In, in Spain, Finland, and Portugal, we uh, perform a, a, a full semantic and geometric gener uh, generalization of the national polygons or uh, grids into uh, uh, European ones, into uh, Korean land cover polygons. Uh, and in Austria, Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, and the Netherlands, we just uh, populate Korean land cover uh, polygons with the thematic information provided by the national inventories. And as I said, we compare the result. So each Korean land cover polygon uh, was analyzed with the same geometry, and within the geometry, we uh, 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 consider the differences in thematic information. We evaluate the, the presence or absence of uh, each uh, uh, high resolution layer parameters translated into Eagle land cover components or attributes. And we uh, calculate the statistic. So a positive number means the uh, an omission error in the high resolution layer a negative uh, number means a commission error in the high resolution layer. 
just to show you, uh, to example, I don't know if, well, more or less, it can be seen. Uh, in the Austrian this, uh, site, we found that there were significant differences in seal present uh, between the uh, national inventory and the, uh, the, the high resolution layer of about uh, 29 uh, in case of roads and some small differences in discontinuous buildings. In, um, in three canopy cover, there were important differences uh, the, of about uh, 35 uh, percent of relative differences between the present in the uh, national inventories and the, uh, the European ones. And uh, also some uh, differences, uh, big differences were found in the case of Finland. Uh, these, these differences appear in all the, the, the test site in different, uh, in, for example, in agricultural land or vegetation or even water. So to conclude, uh, this uh, geometric test uh, exercise had to be limited because of the time and the resources, but even with this limitation, we consider that the, con the eagle concept is, uh, is working very well uh, in a bottom-up uh, generation of the um, Copernicus-like product uh, using the national uh, information. Uh, in practice, uh, uh, we, we know that the, the, the conceptual uh, eagle data model is really very exhaustive, very wide. So to be, uh, to be practical, to move forward, we should try to work in a reduced version of this data model, uh, which could be applied in most of the European countries uh, to really improve Korean and, 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 and the higher resolution layer uh, products. And uh, finally, we have to say that uh, uh, these differences in, in, in the statistics and uh, in the comparison were very similar to those found in previous exercises by several member states. But it's the first time that we can compare these differences in a harmonized way using the, the, the Eagle concept. And uh, just a final uh, uh, comment. In the plenary session today, one of the speakers talked a lot about um, uh, the importance of hide the complexity for final user. This is very important, uh, considering Eagle. Eagle is techni technically very complex, and because of this, it's really powerful. But it's uh, necessary to allocate or to think in allocating resources to also design uh, uh, end user solution uh, which can be very understandable for non expert user. And that's all. Thank you. Um, thanks much. Um, yes, I'm Teresa Raventos uh, from the University of Leicester. And I will speak, like the last uh, speaker, about an application and rather uh, inspire and Copernicus comes in the background of how we use the data in this particular uh, project. Um, I will speak about Saturn satellite application for urban mobility. And what we try to um, develop in order to, uh, um, to tackle a challenge for the uh, city of uh, Bordeaux. I will talk about the technology developments behind it. It's a heavy, uh, heavy goods baker router uh, which uh, is based on open source data that the local authorities had, apart from uh, some proprietary uh, data sets. Data treatment, I'll go into the, some sensors we uh, try to include into this uh, AGB router to augment its capabilities, and some uh, suggestions, perhaps, for other applications uh, from, um, from this particular project and what we learn from it. So why Bordeaux? Well, as in many cities, uh, it's got an issue of sprawling and as such has a lot of pressure on uh, its urban network. And therefore, um, we focused on trying to minimize the transport, well, minimize 
the problems that transport movement of freight can cause in, in that city, in particular because um, the movements happen quite centrally to that city. And so the warehouse are quite focused in a, a 10 kilometer a square of the Bordeaux, uh, Bordeaux body center. <coughs> Not only that, I will explain later what's uh, the problems of, of uh, the truck movements. So Saturn is not only involved in this um, AGB route planner, which try to uh, um, provide a solution for congestion, reducing the congestion, and appropriate routes for AGBs. Um, we are partnering with uh, a set of different demonstrators uh, who have been talking about their uh, the experience during this project the geoinformation platform developed by Terranes uh, was, uh, uh, was this morning, the Urban Atlas developed by Serema and some others have to improve the uh, road safety using models and UAVs. So I'm gonna focus on the AGB route planner. So the first thing we needed to do is basically design it in a way that will uptake uh, data from Bordeaux. What we found is more than 300 points only for signs of 3.5 tonnage. So that was already telling us um, what we, the scale that we are gonna face here, how we're gonna treat this data, and in what format we are finding it. And I'll speak well later on, on what type of base maps we use and the utilization of SRI properties, um, which were the baseline to provide uh, the appropriate route. So basically the demonstrator was trying to develop a hybrid system for AGB, uh, AGB uh, freight operators, for example, uh, which didn't have a digital format of the regulations at a local level. So that was coming from local authorities that had this problem. They had a paper map for freight, for uh, operators or fleet uh, managers, that they had to, uh, to uh, follow on the routes that they were specified to follow. Um, in the case of Bordeaux, so we found that Bordeaux Metropole actually had a lot of information and a lot of data freely available, amazing. I'll, I'll go to, to, to the detail of the portal. But we had to use also, to make it available for everyone, a system that actually, you don't have to rely on, on as many proprietary things, uh, components into it. We tried to use open uh, street maps, although it has its uh, back drought, you, you, you actually has a good capability in there to provide quite a good detail of, of the road network. And as I said, uh, in here, there is the sensor we added at heart onto the mobile device to, in, to acquire further positioning data for that truck and, and therefore not try, trying to rely more on the on the whole <laughs> scope of this, uh, uh, of this tool, rather than actually the, 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 the navigation device as well on the side. <coughs> Some of the preparatory maps uh, were used by a partner of us that were developing the algorithms as a back end. So these were an us actually. They were uh, using the here maps or SRI maps <coughs> preparatory. I'm not gonna go into much of the detail, but this is how it looks, the system, divided in the different components. So we have the GNSS receiver, which is, in this case is external. Of course, if you have the tablet or the mobile phone, you will have your own GPS, GLONASS, you know, the capabilities there. But what we wanted to trigger in here is actually the new Galileo system. Uh, see if that would provide us with further accuracy in, in, in the positioning. So that was uh, included into the, with, a, with an API 
and to provide the positioning data and include it into the final date uh, map. Um, we had some uh, uh, properties um, um, of interest, basically all the map uh, of the network information and the root vector, which was uh, queried from the freight gateway, which is the algorithm calculated by this uh, company that we collaborated. So it was a quite of a, a good team uh, work to develop the final map. Finally, well, the, the map server, which is open stream map. Um, the data. So as I said before, we have um, Bordeaux Metropole Open Data Portal, um, which I find it, um, it follows the inspired directives. Uh, but also it has, um, it, it encourages actually, in this case, other people to use the data provided in different formats for their applications. So it encourages SMEs to develop their own applications. So there is all sorts of applications there to try to find the toilet in the city, et cetera, et cetera. What we were looking for uh, specifically was data relevant to freight industry. And that was the more difficult because in France, or in the case in Bordeaux, they had fragmentation of the data availability. Certain data is available from the local authorities because they have the type of vehicle they um, can't count for that road, but then the, the, the number of trips or the, the type of road that these um, uh, tracks will go through is, is not available through the portal. So we had to go into the freight industry to get that data. And in fact, it was the local authorities acting as a broker in order to get further information. So it was a benefit for both of us. It was a benefit for the local authorities that didn't see initially what, what was the use of giving us such information and calling the, the, the freight industry and bothering them about this information. They saw that the opportunity <laughs> of the, um, those routes that are mainly used by the freight could actually be uh, used for them as a, as a planning, um, as a network or, or transport planning, if you want, uh, in the future to, to plan ahead on events, et cetera, et cetera, and to deliver certain information that uh, will be tar uh, targeted to this uh, freight industry. So there are two things here. You have the freight industry, which wants to go through the generally faster route, which uh, cuts down on fuel consumption and basically on economy, on the economy. But on that, my impact on on the health of people living there because of the air pollution. This, is a, this was last year, basically happens quite often. We had the track in, in the UK, uh, which had a logo. Um, it was a DIY track delivery. It said, we fit, and it was stuck like that under, under a bridge, so I didn't put it in there. It was funny to see that in the newspapers. So it can cause a lot of damage to the road surfaces, buried utilities if the weight exceeds what is expected for that road. And obviously the environmental issues when people are living there, the noise that they, they provide and the vibration as well. So this is how it looks, the end product. You have, uh, for mobile phones, you can visualize it in a way that not all the information is all cluttered there. It filters the information in a way that is visible at a smaller, a smaller uh, screens. And so it aims to be actually an end user, uh, easy to, to, to basically <coughs> see and use. The Freight Wegway is our partner's um, algorithms and also visualization and a desktop version. So you can actually access the routine 
through your desktop. So our aims was basically easy to use interface for mobile phones and desktop, a low cost. So we try to use as well all the open, uh, open data and open source um, um, softwares. It provides the positioning from the built-in and external GNSS receiver, but also a rapid calculation of the, of the route. The route we did, actually, we tested. And it provided, this is where an accident happened because a truck went through uh, exceeding the, the height. Um, when we went there, actually, we saw that it was, the signs were clearly, well, they were posted, there were two signs, but were obscured by, um, by different other type of signs in front of them, so traffic lights, trees, as you can see there. So depending on which angle you're coming through that road, there's no way you can see that sign, and it might be for the truck driver a dangerous case. So, as I said, this is not a satellite navigation divide as you could find, you could ask, actually, there are lots of satellite navigations out there, why, why bother, why do we want this information? And it's because it's a local user. And what we try to do in here is because trucks are using the own um, Genesis receiver, we try to actually augment the capabilities uh, by uh, having the Galileo signals um, uh, set up. So we did, uh, uh, if you want, I have the summary of, uh, of different commercial available GNSS receivers with the different prices and there's lots out there. But if you ask a truck driver, well, uh, an operative uh, op um, freight operator to get that GNSS, which costs hundreds of pounds, they're not gonna be keen to go through it. They normally pay up to, I've been in talks with them, up to 10 pounds per, per, per receiver. So what do you expect? You're gonna be one minute, <laughs> okay. So this is what we did as a test, uh, external GNSS. If you want to go more in details about it, you can ask me later. But I wanted to focus now onto the applications of what we learned on using the mapping and different layers, different information hopefully available to our expertise at the university as well. We know quite a lot of air pollution and we use different sensors, uh, in situ sensors on the city. This is the city of Leicester where we started this project actually. And it shows here the different pollution hotspots uh, derived mainly from road. Road is one of the main em emitters, well, road transport is one of the main emitters of, of, of uh, <laughs> air pollution, PMs, NOxes, and it's represented in here, the NOx distribution with the different roads. This is a major um, intersection with the motorway. As you can see, it's, it's quite high. So the, the, the key for the local authorities was to use this data, and in specific, having Copernicus Mark II as a baseline. It provides you an interesting um, information for all the area you are looking at, and not only a specific points where the, the sensors are, are there. And I will finish with the nice picture, which it is not as nice if you are living near the main roads where pollution is high, as you can see. Uh, some of the councils have to pay now. The, well, they are uh, being considered for fees um, as they oversee, um, yeah, as they go over the limit of the air pollution uh, indicators from the air, uh, European Commission. So thanks very much for listening, and I hope it, was, it wasn't too tedious. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, thank you, Teresa, for this interesting presentation, new application, new insights. Uh, we will take a few other minutes, even if the coffee break is there, uh, for having eventually a few questions from the room. You have heard several interesting presentations, different applications, different usage of Inspire and Copernicus data, so the marriage is already there in those examples. 
but I guess you might have a particular question for one or for all the presenters. So please give your name and your affiliation uh, when, before uh, posing your question. Anyone that wants to kick off? You go. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Hugo de Groep from uh, DG Environment. Is the microbe working? Okay. Um, I have a question for Kevin on the marine application. Why do you think your users do not care about Inspire compliance? I think it was a question for you. Yeah, I was expecting that one. Um, I, I'm not sure. I guess um, if you take the example of the Water Framework Directive reporting, they wanted a GIF image um, to represent the quality state, the eutrophication status of their waters. So. Um, I guess they didn't need Inspire, the benefits of Inspire for that, I guess. I don't know, maybe it has also to do with trust. Maybe the users trust this information coming from an infrastructure and they think they want to see simple maps or a simple application and they assume that is what is behind this of good quality. I assume that's one of the, might be one of the answers. Okay, yes, I have another question. Uh, my name is Johannes Melles. I'm from the Federal Maritime and Hydrographic Agency in Germany. And I'm responsible for the development of the marine data infrastructure. And um, my question is, we were talking about marriage between, yeah, um, uh, Copernicus data and Inspire data. And what I've heard here in almost all the presentations was that people were taking Copernicus data and maybe a little piece of Inspire data and maybe some other data set as well. And then uh, doing their processing work and doing, fulfilling their task and things like that. And is that definitely the marriage you're looking for? Is that so? Because I was expecting a little bit more. Because I was because we have. I think uh, what we are all looking for when we are here at the Inspire conference is that we uh, we don't want to deal with 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 so many different data sets, so many different many different structures. We are really looking forward to get one data infrastructure, which could be used for s different tasks. And uh, so what I see here is uh, having two or even more different uh, structures which have to be uh, used for, for fulfilling a task. And um, I don't know if, if that is really uh, sufficient and if that's the way we want to go in the future. So I don't know if anybody is uh, able to, to respond on that, but... Uh, Basically, my end users are, 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 are watching a TV program. They want to have nice pictures with good information. They are not very much inter interested how we cook it or how we, how we technically create that uh, nice picture on a TV screen. And uh, we are we engineers and we, and we, are, we are responsible for the quality are, are interested in that. But on the other hand, so I'm juggling and uh, getting uh, the information that the end users need as fast as possible to the end users, and on the other hand, uh, co collecting uh, uh, and combining and organizing and quality uh, quality assessing my all the different data sources with with F, with uh, the programs that I have or with uh, the tools that I have at hand. So um, uh, uh, basically, it's kind of kind of a pragmatic uh, uh, approach, and I don't think uh, you are sort of looking to it. Uh, at, uh, I think you are looking at, at a different level than what we are uh, uh, achieving. Okay, let's go on with the discussion. A quick response to that. Um, yes, the end user is not interested in complicated data structures and all that stuff. He wants to see simple pictures or simple data sets. Um,
Yeah. That's what I was exactly talking about, is uh, you, have to, you have to make these pictures, and you have to provide these pictures to the end user, and if, to, if you want to do that, you need good data, and you need easy to use data. And if you have to deal with a lot of different structures, you can do that maybe in a project. Maybe you have the, maybe you have the resources to do that in a project. But on a day-to-day -day business, I think you have to keep things as simple as possible. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, I think, uh, I, we have to look for a better way to bring these things together. Someone else? Some thoughts on that? OK. I'm Nuno from Daimos, Portugal. Um, I, I made a presentation this morning about trying to touch this, this, this topic. Because as a company, what we want, as a company, as an institute, what we want is to decrease the time to market of any service. And we can't do that by putting a huge directive that takes a long time to, to understand what it is, to, to put things together, and apply this directly to a service. This takes a long time. It is needed support at national level or at its institutional level to apply this. Companies by themselves won't, uh, won't, um, won't go for it because it's too expensive. It's just too expensive. Okay, thank you. The interesting thoughts. Uh, I saw someone else you wanted to. Well, I'm, uh, I'm a specialist in, uh, in, in marriages. Not, not, not because I've had so many, but I had a very long one. Well, very 32 years is rather considerable. And within that marriage, I've seen our demand and supply, the requirements that we had on each other evolve quite significantly. And many years ago, when I was also just putting data together, satellite data, meteorological data, other data, I didn't really care how it was delivered. I was just happy that I could get it. And I think the first thing about Inspire, when we talk Inspire compliance, we need to understand what it means legally. And the first legal compliance is Inspire, you share your data as is, without any practical obstacles at the point of use. And I think many, including the Copernicus program, are not doing this. Many are not yet doing it. They are not compliant. And your user, what he wants in the end, is indeed the product that suits his needs without these practical obstacles. If he gets your little GIF image and it says copyright over it, right? you cannot reuse it, you cannot print it, you cannot do this, then your end user, in your case, is going to be very unhappy. But your end user is somebody who wants to put things together. Your end user wants to put things together. You want to put things together, and you want to save costs. And if you get it in a nicely structured way, through services, which everybody uses, then you are going to reduce the cost of your application. And this is more about technical conformity. Are you using these services, which anyhow everybody is using, WMS, WCS, source, or even more effective ones, to which Inspire only refers in guidances. If you want to share, these are the, the nice things to use out there. But please make sure that there is a service in place. And the first service that you must have in place is a simple, can be an FTP, an HTTP service and your user is going to be happy, and legally, again, you're going to be compliant with Inspire, because there is a service in place. The only thing that we would certainly want, and then maybe you know more about this than me, we want to also to have metadata, and that somewhere your data is published and cataloged, and not just the people that know your shop can find this data. That's all I wanted to say about marriages, but I'm open for all kind of counseling afterwards. But please, only about Inspire and not about my partner. Okay, another question there. 
I would continue the the um, subject on marriage so, and, and love. So tomorrow we'll have a workshop uh, that we call the ELF plus inspires big love. So, and, uh, and actually we'll try to explain how we in ELF project progressed uh, with this idea, as you said, that uh, the users like to get uh, access to the authoritative data on the simple way. So uh, we faced a number of problems. I would not repeat what we'll tell tomorrow. So we faced a number of problems, and, uh, <clears throat> and actually uh, we all, we are partly victims of the flexibility of Inspire requirements because they, sometimes they are too flexible and there are more than one way implementing Inspire requirements. And uh, unfortunately, it's not uh, very easy to combine Inspire compliance services, but uh, we need to move forward. And I think we have a good progress, as we hear in many presentations. So, but uh, what we try to arrange also, we try to arrange the access for application developers for the private sector companies or universities making uh, APIs, helping users connect with the data. Because there are some complexity in Inspire services that it's not easy to overtake by users and GIS vendors are not ready today harvesting Inspire data. So we are looking for the, for the vendors to, to move on, but also I think we need this uh, intermediate platforms that collect information and allow users to easy, or application developers and using KPIs, easy exploit that data. That is the concept in the future. I think that might work. Okay. Uh, maybe we have, oh, another question there. Sorry. <laughs> okay, just a so, uh, uh, additional comment to uh, what I've said during the presentation. Uh, here, uh, the, the importance of uh, uh, make things easy to end user has been uh, 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 several times uh, stressed. But it's also important to remember that reality is very complex. So we are going to have a wide diversity of end users. And we have to think in a diversity of easy and solution for those users. So uh, again, uh, I would like to stress the importance of uh, allocate time, resources, and uh, expertise in designing how to uh, uh, provide our data. Thank you. The last question, and then I want to close with conclusion. Um, Bruce McCormack is my name. Um, I was once responsible for a national planning information system. I'd just like to pick up on the point that not everybody wants things to be quicker, simpler, cheaper, and easier. There is a segment of society out there which want it more expensive and more complicated. Um, the system that I particularly developed, a guy came up to me, put his face right in my face, and he angrily said to me, you know what you've done to me? I don't know who this guy is. And I said, no, what? He said, I used to be able to charge a client a day and a half's worth of work because of what I'd done, I can now do it in 20 minutes. My response to him was 20 seconds. So not everybody is interested in cheaper, quicker, easier. Some people want the complexity because their income stream is based on it. Okay. Um, I, I think what I want to close because it's a quarter two, so otherwise no coffee anymore. Uh, I think what I've heard from the different presentations and also from the interventions is that maybe we didn't see literally in some other project Inspire popping up or Inspire com conformance or compliance. But in reality, for most of the applications, we have seen the fact that you can have easy, easier access to a lot of geospatial data, satellite imagery is in fa a fact. Uh, all those applications should not would not have been possible without already Inspire components in place, Copernicus comp components in place, open data, uh, adding other information to do something. And then the second lesson I learned from the different interventions and presentations is that 
indeed, uh, it's not the push of the button to have an answer on your questions. You need to do some work, some, sometimes some hard work, processing, pre-processing, bringing things together. And then some of the interventions suggest, yes, we might help there to facilitate this processing preparation of applications of new maps of new insights by providing APIs or other tools or platform that facilitates and that helps implementers of those end user solutions. And I think that's something that we see and heard al already in the plenary, I think, and in other sessions. So that's maybe something we have to take on board. And I want to end up with the fact that there will be a, another session on Friday on Copernicus Inspire and open data. So maybe we can continue the discussion there. So I will chair that session as well. Just a small, sorry, a small comment for those interested in learning a little, a little bit more about the Eagle concept in land monitoring. Uh, uh, there is a session tomorrow afternoon and there will be a presentation, so you are all invited. Okay, so I will close the session. Thanks again for all the speakers and thanks for the contribution in the, in the debate.